Now, when you calculate your cash flows from operating activities, IS7 indicates to us that you can either use your direct method or you can use your indirect method. Now, in a scenario, they will indicate to you if they want you to use your direct or your indirect method. And guys, if they do not indicate anything, you can use the method that you want to use. Now, let's have a look at the difference. Our direct method is our major classes of our gross cash receipts and gross cash payments. Therefore, when you look at our direct method, this is your template of your direct method. Your direct method will start with your cash receipts from customers and your cash paid to suppliers and employees. Now, we did discuss the calculations in our structure. And then you need to take out all of your separately disclosable items, interest received paid, dividends received paid, income taxes. Now, your direct method, when you look at this, guys, it will start at the top of your profit and loss statement. Now, why do I indicate at the top? When you calculate your cash receipts from customers, you know, step number one, you need to include your revenue from your profit or loss. Step number two, you need to calculate your movement in your trade receivables. Then when you look at your cash paid to suppliers and employees, where do you start? With your expenses. Take out your non-cash items as well as your items that should be separately disclosed. One. Two. Your movement in your inventory. Three. Your movement in your trade payables. Compared to our indirect method. Our indirect method you need to start at the bottom of your profit and loss statement. Now, why do I indicate at the bottom? Because you need to include your profit before tax. And then you adjust your profit before tax with all of your non-cash items and your items that should be separately disclosed in terms of IS7. And then you take into account your changes in working capital that consist out of your trade receivables, your inventory and your trade payables. And number three, you need to include your separately disclosed items. Therefore, when you look at this and you want to divide it into steps, your first step, you need to start with your profit before tax, take out all of your non-cash items and your separately disclosed items. Number two, include your changes in your working capital and number three, Include your separately disclosed items in terms of IS7. Now, the net cash will be exactly the same, 1.9 million, when you compare this to your direct method, 1.9 million. Now, guys, my recommendation, when you attempt questions, write down your steps. For example, cash receipts, how do you calculate this? Revenue, movement, trade, receivables, cash paid. How do I calculate this? All of my expenses. Take out my non-cash items. Take out my items that should be separately disclosed. Movement in my inventory and movement in my trade payables. Now, when we look at our second category, our investing activities. Remember guys, I have already indicated to you that this will be your assets section on your statement of financial position. 
This will be acquisitions and disposals of long-term assets and other investments, not included in cash equivalents. Now you can work through the examples. Financing activities. Activities that result in changes in size and composition of the contributed equity and borrowings of the entity. Again guys, equity and liabilities movement. When you need to prepare a cash flow statement, a tip that I can give you, and guys, I still do this today when I prepare cash flow statements for entities, is that you need to start with your statement of financial position. You need to include a T account for all of your accounts. Now, on your T account, include your opening balance and your closing balance. From there, guys, you need to tick off all of your amounts that you have used on your statement of financial position to ensure that you did take this into account in your cash flow statement. And then from there, you need to read the information provided to ensure that you include all of your significant accounts and transactions. We are now going to work through a very basic lecture example. The following are extracts from the statements of financial position of two companies, P Limited and S Limited, as at 31 December. Now, before we look at our statement of financial position, you need to ensure that you understand the difference between your assets, liabilities, equity income, and expenses, T accounts increases, decreases, debit side or credit side. Then you need to ensure that you know what will influence an increase or decrease in these accounts and what will the influence be on our bank account. Remember the focus is our bank account. We are busy with a reconciliation of our bank account. Now, when you look at the statement of financial position of P Limited, we are able to identify that there's an investment in S Limited on 31 December 20.13 of 88,000. But for the previous year, this was zero. Therefore, we can identify that this investment occurred in our 20.13 financial year. Now, when you look at your property, plant and equipment, why will our property, plant and equipment balance move, guys? For example, from 20.12 to 20.13 to 250 million or 250,000, sorry, and then 20.13 to 14, 420,000. Why will property, plant and equipment move? Now, this can either be purchases, it can be due to impairments, uh, accumulated depreciation, there can be write-offs, they could have sold, disposed of certain items, and there can be an FCTR account in terms of IS21. Now, when we look at our receivables, why will receivables move? Sales on credit, payments being received, interest charged on overdue accounts, possible provision for bad debts. Now, this is what I want to indicate to you. You need to ensure that you understand your T accounts. When and why will an account increase or decrease? Now let's read through the information provided to us. P Limited obtained control over S Limited with the acquisition of 80% interest in S Limited on 31 December 20.13 for a cash amount of 88,000. Immediately we are able to identify a cash amount of 88,000. When you think about your Transaction, debit, the investment and in the subsidiary in peace records and credit our bank with the 88,000. 
Now remember that this is in B Limited's records. Now in B Limited's records, we will have to indicate in the cash flow statement that there's an outflow of 88,000 and our cash flow from investing activities. Remember, investment in a subsidiary. Now remember that this is in the separate records of P Limited. But guys, when you think about your group cash flow, remember, we will have to consolidate. Now in the separate records of P Limited, P Limited credited the bank with 88,000. But when we consolidate and you look at S Limited, S Limited has cash available of 20,000. Therefore, the net effect on your group, remember now, in our group, we have an outflow of 88,000 and the inflow of 20,000 relating to the cash available in S Limited records. Therefore, in our group, we will have a net outflow of 68,000. Now, on the acquisition of S Limited, no unidentified assets or liabilities existed, and the fair value of all the assets and liabilities was considered to be equal to the carrying amounts thereof, our IFRS 3 principles. P Limited elected to measure the non-controlling interest at the proportionate share of the acquiree's identifiable net assets at the acquisition date. Now guys, remember NCI either at fair value or proportionate share. Now if they indicate to us that this is at proportionate share, what is the value of our NCI on this date? How do we calculate the proportionate share only from our statement of financial position? When you refer to the statement of financial position of S Limited, our equity being our share capital and our retained earnings amounts to 110,000. Now this is the net assets, 110,000. Therefore, 110,000 times 20% and this is 22,000, will be allocated to the NCI. Then they indicate to us, no dividends have been paid for the years ended 31 December 20.13 and 14. Guys, you will have to please read the information provided and identify if the dividends are outstanding or not. Okay. Therefore, guys, remember, if they have declared dividends, but they have not yet paid these dividends, remember. Remember, if they have declared, but they did not yet pay this, therefore you will have to debit your dividends declared in your statement of changes in equity, and you will have to credit your dividend liability. Now, in this example, they've indicated to us that no dividends have been paid for the years in the 31 December 20.13 and 14. But guys, based on this, no dividends have been paid. And in the statement of financial position, there's no account relating to our shareholders for dividends in the liability section. Therefore, we can assume no dividends have been, pa have been paid or declared during this year. Now, assume there are no intra-group transactions and no other comprehensive income items. If the requirement indicated that you had to prepare annual financial statements for the group, remember, you will only consolidate for 20.13 as the parent purchased the subsidiary, 31 December 20.13. Therefore, guys, important for your cash flow, of 20.13, your cash flow statement of 20.13. At the beginning of the year, we only had our parent. Therefore, if you use your bank account 
for your opening balance. You only had your parent. At the end of the year, we have the parent plus our subsidiary. Therefore, in your closing balance of your bank account, you need to include the parent's balance plus the subsidiary's balance. Then you need to ensure that you understand, guys. You need to be able to prepare a recon of your retained earnings. Remember, your retained earnings basic reconciliation will include your opening balance of your retained earnings plus the profit or loss for the year minus dividends being declared and this will be your closing balance. Now this is the recon of a single entity's retained earnings. Now how do we prepare the cash flow statement of this group? Where do we start? Now my first step I had to ensure that I understand what happened. I know that they've purchased the subsidiary end of 20.13. Why is this important to me? In my opening balances, we will only have our parent. In my closing balances, we need to include the parent plus the subsidiary's details. Then my second step, I will add my templates. Now, what is the templates, guys? The template is my cash flow statement with my three categories. Operating activities, investing activities, financing activities. I will immediately also include my opening balance and closing balance of my bank account. I will also include, guys, and this is my personal preference. I know that it does take some time. I know that. But guys, when you make use of T accounts and you understand the increase and decrease, I'm pretty sure that you will know when to include your brackets and when not. Therefore, I will briefly include T accounts for all of my accounts on my statement of financial position. And number three, I will complete my T accounts. How do I do that? I include my opening balances and my closing balances. I take into account the fact that we've purchased a subsidiary. Therefore, during the year, I need to include my details relating to my subsidiary. I need to read the information provided to identify if there's additional things that I need to take into account. And I will calculate my balancing figure and I will immediately transfer this to my main template being my cash flow statement.